It's called Tempête de Boulette Giante. <laughs> Bras de toe. Bras de dos. <laughs> Maître bourré. Fausse blonde infiltrée. That's not bad. A video store. There's still video stores. <laughs> Combat de maître. Does that mean drunken master? Yeah. Oh, that, oh, that just means a combat master? Yeah, combat master, yeah. Oh, so there's nothing about being drunk. No. <laughs> it's just called combat master. What a missed opportunity. It's about being drunk. Boiru. Doesn't that mean drunk? Boiru? Bourré. Bourré. Yeah. It should be maître bourré. <laughs> well, that's why not enough people saw a drunken master in France. <laughs> so this is the sequel. Which is better? That's that's Legend of the Drunken Master is the sequel. So this is like uh, my favorite kung fu movie is Jackie Chan's The Legend of the Drunken Master, which was I think in Hong Kong it was just called Drunken Master Two, and then we made up a title and you guys made up a title, Combat Master. <laughs> but he's not just a combat master; he's a master of drunken boxing, which is someone who gets wasted on alcohol and only then can he fight. And so it's like a very stylized combat movie, but it's also brutal. There's like a scene where his father throat kicks him out of the house and he's sobbing and sad after he's done this whole fight. Uh, so there's even like family drama in it, kind of like my movie. Just let me go. But the most brutal fight scene is this one right here uh, where he has like a giant bamboo pole that gets split at the tips and he fights like a hundred guys and just keeps lacerating them and they're bleeding. <laughs> is like not all fun and games. He's yeah. drunk for the whole movie. <laughs> it's about having an alcohol problem. Combat de maître, a classic. I don't know if this was on my list, but it's no. incredible. Uh, this was definitely the first movie that I fell in love with uh, my friend Michelle watching. She's my friend now. <laughs> gorgeous and like poetic and the the plot's poetic and the fighting's poetic and it's not just about who can punch harder it's about like balance and control which is kind of like stunning the like fight scene in there where she's like trying to stop her from running away but without hurting her and they're just kept they're stomping on each other's toes is just it's incredible and then the scene where like she's up in the trees um just hanging on bamboo leaves dan and i reference that all the time it's just like a poetic version of a fight scene. God, Parasite's incredible. Kind of paved the way for us to have subtitles in our movie and for Americans to still uh, go see it. <laughs> Shaolin Soccer, my other favorite Hong Kong movie. No! But yeah, I loved soccer when I was a kid. I loved football. It was my sport of choice. So when I saw this movie and it was like, someone combined kung fu with soccer. I was like, I'm already on board, but it's so silly uh, and just incredible filmmaking. It's just like carefully shot and such a smart use of practical and visual effects where like, uh, even though the CGI is really bad, um, you don't care because the storytelling's so good. It's like the ball looks fake but it's just such good shot design and the, the, the world is affected by the ball in a way where you're like, oh, it's great, I don't care. It doesn't have to be the perfect CGI. And Stephen Chow is just like an incredible. Apparently he liked my new movie. My hero Stephen Chow told Michelle Yeoh that the movie's good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Paprika was a big reference for the movie. Dan and I like, a lot of times people say like, your movies are so crazy. And we're like, have you watched anime? Like. <laughs> Like, anime is so formally inventive of what can be a story, and obviously visually inventive because, like, in an animated world, you can kind of make anything happen. Paprika pulls off, like, a version of maximalism that, like, is so rare in cinema. Like, there's this ongoing parade that's happening that's just every aesthetic and every sound, and it's happy but scary, and, like, you visually can't quite keep up with it. In a way, we wanted that for our movie, you know, um, to, for the audience to feel like they can't quite trust what might happen next, mm -hmm. which in this movie, like, you just lose track of, like, where you are at any moment, you could be somewhere else, and you just have to kind of give yourself over to it, um, which is very impressive. But Satoshi Kon is also just a brilliant writer, and, like, the characters are incredible and like 
Tokyo Godfathers is like a perfect example of one where he like there's zero fantasy and it's just great characters, great storytelling. He's just a good filmmaker. It's not just that he does like science fiction. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, this is a movie we ripped off for our movie. Uh, aesthetically, uh, we just did it again, which was extra terrifying because uh, Ki Kwan, who plays Waymond in our movie, uh, worked for Wong Kar Wai for years. Uh, Wong Kar Wai introduced him to his now wife. On the day when we were filming, we were like, do you think Wong, you know, do you think uh, he calls him Kar Wai? Do you think Kar Wai would hate this, you know? Or like, are we, are we ruining it? And he's like, no, he'd love it. This looks great. He'd really love it. And he would like text him and be like, Karwai is so excited to see the movie. And I'd be like, stop texting Wong Karwai. I'm so nervous. I haven't heard what he thought yet, so he might be pissed. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Karwai. I should ask Key. I could text Key right now and be like, did Wong Karwai ever, did Wong Karwai like our movie? And then by the end of this interview, I'll tell you. Cool. <laughs> All right, we'll see if he responds. Spoiler, il a reçu le texto en repartant et non, Wong Kar Wai n'a toujours pas vu le film. My favorite fact about Wong Kar Wai is that uh, step printing is what he's known for, where like there's only a few frames per second, which apparently he did because it's cheaper, you know? It requires like 12 times less film, you know, uh, per second when you're on set and also requires 12 times less uh, lighting. So like if you're running around downtown Hong Kong and you don't have a lighting budget, uh, if you do step printing, There's plenty of light, you know, because uh, you only you only need two frames. It's a little slow shutter. And now, you know, we just did it. We didn't need to. We just did it because we wanted our movie to look like his because it's beautiful. <laughs> French, not a French movie. Did I tell you Eternal Sunshine? I don't know. This might be my favorite film of all time. Okay. By a French guy, Michel Gondry. I tell you everything. Every damn embarrassing thing. And I, uh, relate to him because I heard in an interview somewhere again this you get to fact check all my cool movie facts <laughs> <laughs> apparently Michelle saw this movie with an audience and the audience was laughing at parts he didn't think were funny okay. um, because his English wasn't good enough and so there's jokes that Charlie Kaufman put in there and that the actors like discovered that like he himself the director couldn't know yeah. Yeah. you know and I relate because with my movie there's a lot of jokes within the translation, within the Chinese, within our movies in Cantonese, Mandarin, and English. And like, I don't speak it, so I don't know. It's like Dan Kwan and the cast and their families will laugh at jokes and I'll be like, cool, I'm glad, you know? Uh, so I, f I feel uh, alienated from my own film, just like Michelle. Uh, but I'm also proud of my movie, just like he should be, because this is the best movie that ever got made. I've probably seen Amelie like five or six times. I was just thinking about Amelie earlier. I'm supposed to talk about this, but I kept in my brain going like, because everyone's speaking French around me, I kept going, what is that from? And I couldn't remember. And like, that's the name of the guy she's trying to find. No, Bordeaux. Bordeaux. Holy Motors blew my mind and Dan Kwan's mind. And we showed it to people on our movie because we were like, look, here's proof movies don't have to follow any rules. Mm. Like there's something like magical about this movie. Because it's an art film that still makes you emotional. Like every scene is another a surreal short film but they complement each other and each one you care. And like, just when you think the filmmaker's being random for random sake, it'll like sneak up and like move you, you know? Um, I also have like such a love for behind the scenes uh, photos of actors on big budget movies in motion capture suits uh, looking really sad. <laughs> um, and there's a whole scene in this where he like has sex on a motion capture stage with like a woman dressed in green. And it just, it's like so beautiful and so stupid. And he's like walking on a treadmill that's like with a fake gun. And uh, I feel like Leos Carax, uh thinks motion capture is just as funny as I think motion capture is. <laughs> so that was uh, exciting. But then he made it sexy, which was just so unexpected. Uh, but yeah, Dan and I just adore this movie. Yeah. What's it called en français? Uh, Fausse blonde infiltré. In English, it's just white chicks. Yo, what's up, money? You got a problem? 
Nah, yo, hold my poodle. Huh? Hold my poodle, dog. Uh, this is one of my favorite films. It's horribly offensive, uh, definitely outdated, politically very incorrect. But <laughs> those are the scariest movie monsters I've ever seen, are these uh, women. Like, there's close-ups in the movie of them and their blue contacts, and it's scarier than anything Guillermo del Toro has ever put to <laughs> film. And there's something so funny to me about men hitting on them when they look like uh, aliens, and I just I can't get enough of it. I think there's something so bizarre. I want to remake it as, like, um, a uh, hard R drama that goes for Oscars, you know? But it's just about race and identity and gender, and it's just a lot of, like, sad music as the Wayans are just peeling the makeup off and wondering who they are anymore, which I feel like is something very relevant these days, you know? As we all start to deconstruct how gender and sexuality are just a construct. So, white chicks, look out for it. I'm gonna <laughs> remake that someday. <laughs> I've only seen two movies in theaters multiple times in the last few years. It's Midsommar and uh, Worst Person in the World. Midsommar is so upsetting but beautiful. And like I've, I found myself like admiring the community even as I was horrified by the community that she visits. But the biggest thing for me with Midsommar is that the villain is uh, like a cowardly boyfriend who won't have difficult conversations or admit that he sucks. Did she oh. say why? No, no. That sucks. On the, on the subject of couples, actually, um, is there ever an issue here with incest? Um, but he's not a bad guy, you know, like, like murdering or like, mm. uh, and, and so he was a villain that like I could relate to. And so it's a scary movie to watch like someone be a bad boyfriend and like, especially a horror film that like do guys are all going to go see this movie and hopefully see themselves a little bit in Jack Rayner, you know? And I think he's just such a convincing shithead in this movie. And, and I saw the movie and afterwards with, with a bunch of other male filmmakers and everyone was just so torn up about what happened to him. And I was like, oh, that movie's brilliant. That's like, this movie's fucking great. Like, I can't, I'm so excited about how uncomfortable it's making all these mm. dudes who normally just leave a horror film being like, cool, I liked that one kill, you know? And it's like, this time you leave being like, did he deserve that? Because <laughs> <laughs> I've done that. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> Uh, so that's why I love Midsommar. I've been evangelizing about this movie for years. So many people don't realize it's a piece of classic cinema, just groundbreaking uh, genre comedy. It's called Bad Grandpa with Johnny Knoxville. <laughs> it is brilliant. It weaves pranks in with a narrative arc, although it mostly rips off Little Miss Sunshine for its story. I laughed so hard in the theaters with this movie, and I also teared up. It genuinely makes me tear up when I watch this movie, because you just love this this like little guy, and he's the worst, but he just, uh, he's in a tough situation. The, the movies that make me cry are movies where inner city school kids overcome adversity. <laughs> um, and this one's like adjacent, like he, has a bad family life and they're trying to find him a new uh, he's trying to take him to uh his his new dad mm. and that's the arc but then the pranks are wonderful i always say that borat is a movie that exposes some of the worst sides of america you know like it's racism it's homophobia my name is borat i come from kazakhstan can i say uh, first we support your war of terror <laughs> This movie exposes the best sides of America because the whole the, every prank is about how patient people will be with old people and kids. <laughs> they do awful things and people are so patient and they're like, excuse me, sir, your dick's out. Or like, you know, like we, oh, oh, his balls are hanging out. Like someone help him, you know? Like, no, he's the worst and so is he. This movie rules too. I don't like biopics or movies based on true stories and this one broke the rule. It just blew my mind. It's like better than The Godfather. It's just like about shit. Like it's bonkers filmmaking. It's so bold and good. My faith had been shattered in a way I can never fully describe. Every second of my 12 years with Mr. Muhammad, I had been ready to lay down my life for him. Magnolia is uh, three and a half hours, really bleak, and just for some reason puts me in, like it just makes me feel less, like not alone in the world. Like when I go through that journey, it's just like it takes you to the 
darkest place and then brings you out and I just kind of feel like I've been through therapy when I watch this movie. Men are shit. Why? And I think one of the reasons we love it so much is that we don't know why. Hmm. Like we just shouldn't love it as much as we do. I shouldn't love a three and a half hour drama where like a man dying of cancer gives a seven minute monologue that's half gibberish. But for some reason it's just like the music and the pacing, mm. it's like a roller coaster. It just takes you through this emotional journey uh, that just like is unbelievable. Something else Dan and I love doing is like making movies that incorporate our least favorite things. And can we make our least favorite things beautiful? Uh, so like we don't like acapella music and our first movie is all acapella music, you know, <laughs> or don't like farts either. I love that Magnolia is like a bunch of really stereotypical tropey stories. Like, and I think P.T. Anderson intentionally was like, oh, like a strange son is gonna like reconnect with dying father. Cop is gonna fall in love with the criminal he's supposed to arrest. Like all these like silly tropes. And then he just like took them seriously and made three dimensional stories and made you fall in love with them and like made you question your own prejudice and be like, well, I don't know. I guess that story is beautiful even if it's a trope, you know? And then he just throws frogs in there and makes you like wonder what life is and what what on earth this is. And uh, Are you a fan of Tom Cruise? Because he's, he's... I only like Tom Cruise when he's the villain uh, because I think he's a psychopath in real life. And so like, I just don't buy it when he's the love interest or he's the good guy. So Top Gun, no, but Magnolia, yes. Exactly. Magnolia, Collateral, yeah. hell yeah. I'm all about it. But like <laughs> Jerry Maguire, I'm just scared for her. I'm upset that she that he gets the girl and I'm worried about her because she's gonna get Katie Holmes, obviously. Like run. I'm not just has shut up. Just shut up. You had me at hello. Oh my god, I'd prefer Keanu Reeves. Also, his reputation is that he's the sweetest guy, apparently. Never met him. I give you the finger. Also an Asian American icon, people don't know, that he is like, uh, I think a quarter Japanese. Okay. Uh, so he's, you know, um, he did it first. Uh, but this movie, Dan and I watched um, a million times. I think this was like like one of the gateway movies that got me into movies, you know? And I, I love when people say that our movie is doing that to them, that they're watching ours and then they're like, what else can I watch like that? And we're like, bro! <laughs> Watch all of Stephen Chow's stuff and all Wong Kar Wai's stuff. And have you heard of Leos Carax or Terry Gilliam? Like, watch it all. But this one was one that just like, like put, like got me into kung fu movies. Like it, it like it wove in like a uh, philosophy into a movie, which I hadn't seen done in a way that like was so thought provoking, you know, like the movie invites you to question your reality. What a cool thing to do to your audience and then have them walk out and be like, huh, I wonder what I'm going to question, you know? Um, Maybe, maybe God's not real. I'm so done. You, you saw Matrix Evolution, the last one? I saw every, all of them, yeah. yeah. I like this movie a okay. lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, I think there's something about a movie that moves me, that makes me really not want more. You know, like I don't need prequels. I don't need sequels. If I love something, I'm like, oh, no, no, it's great. It's great. It's great. Stay away. Stay away. Don't touch that. I don't want anything else. Just, this is another one that's just quick shout out to Miranda July, who's like a massive inspiration to both of us. What are you doing in my car? <laughs> I don't know you and you certainly don't know anything about me. I mean, what, what if I'm a killer of children? Great filmmaker and great writer. If you haven't read First Bad Man, her book, or her short story t collection, no one, here, no one Belongs Here More Than You, those were just like mind-blowing to Dan and I of just like how sexuality can be woven into a story uh, and be like gray, not black and white, and just how like something like gross or bad or taboo can actually be like so empathetic and fascinating. Um, I think her uh, tone and like empathy powers are just unbelievable and the idea of pooping back and forth forever is just like unbeatable no one's ever done a better uh, sex joke in a movie ever yeah this is one of the best comedies of the 21st century inside a giant meatball 
If you think it's just for kids, you're wrong. It's just objectively, hysterically <laughs> funny and great filmmaking. And like a lot of my favorite comedies, managed to make me cry. It's just like comedy writing genius. They like everything that seems like a throwaway. Like at the beginning, he invents rat birds, and it's like one of his inventions, rat birds, and they suck. And then the rat birds become your favorite part by the end of the movie somehow, which is always like incredible filmmaking to me is when you can make, uh, you can uh, earn emotional stakes out of something that seems like a throwaway, you know? And uh, the children's book is not that good. It's just fine. Lord and Miller do their best work when they take IP that's kind of bad and then they make something good out of it. Plan dumb, master builder. Keep that dirty dick in your pants. It's called Tempête de Boulette Giante. <laughs> <laughs> Boulette is yeah, meatball? Meatballs, yeah. Meatballs, yeah. OK. Tempête de Giante. <laughs> Tempête de Boulette Giante. That's not bad. We are good. Très bien. Merci. Au revoir. Au revoir. Au revoir. Au revoir. Au revoir.